Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for joining our ninth conversation about the impacts of COVID-19 on, on regional, rural and remote Australia. My name is Kate Charters, and I'm the chair of SEGRA, which is the acronym for Sustainable Economic Growth for Regional Australia. We're delighted to welcome Fiona Nash and Narell Pierce to um, our conversation today. Fiona's at Charles Sturt University and Narell's at Central Queensland University. <clears throat> oh, so we're pleased to have been fully subscribed for this timely initiative, um, but it won't be possible to have people actually talk to the panellists. If you um, would like to, uh, or we would like you to participate, um, and there's a chat box and a Q&A at the bottom of the um, screen that uh, you can put your questions or, or comments in and uh, I'll try and read them out and ask our panellists as we um, have the conversation and also we will use that to um, populate further programs that we're um, having. So um, you'll also notice at the top of the chat box there's a link to the resources that we have put together so there's a couple of places there um, for you to go. So what we've been doing is looking at how uh, re regional, rural and remote Australia have been impacted on the COVID virus, how people are responding now and uh, how they're looking, looking to the future. Um, and we've been looking at these issues in terms of the health, the broader economy, education, business, lifestyle and well-being, to name a few. Uh, so Robert's actually been keeping a bit of a mud map going of um, the issues that we've been discussing over the last nine, um, nine webinars. So I'll over to you, Robert. Oh, thanks, Kate. Yep, I'll just uh, give a bit of an update where we're at from now up to a webinar nine. I'll just pull the screen up. <clears throat> Rightio. Yeah, just to recap, started this, um, well, it's over a month ago now, but it really was the notion that this would end at some time and how can we best prepare for the post-pandemic regional Australia? So very much trying to get a discussion that was uh, forward and solution focused. And building on the original metaphor that was talked about is that whole notion of a bridge and, that, and thinking, well, what might be the regional bridge to take our communities into that stronger post pandemic environment. So those conversations we've been having, and they've been quite broad ranging, they've been gradually collating the issues. Um, and this is sort of a, a synergy or a distillation of the communique that Kate does put out at the end of each session. So there is the written communique, and this is more of a visual um, overview as we're adding to it. So where we're at at the moment, and what's been coming through the conversations is ideas being around hard infrastructure for the future, but also identifying the people side as being as critical. So there's a balance of thinking about hard and soft and what that might go into sort of helping the transition to the post-pandemic regional Australia. As we've been having the sessions, I've sort of been building this diagram from left to right in a way, and I'll, I'll just talk about the ones we've added since our last update on the sort of chart. The early um, columns here were from our early speakers across a number of topics, but you might recall, I think about webinar eight we, or seven, we had some leadership discussion, which was a really good uh, conversation. And some of the boxes I've added here that sort of were distilled out of that was um, the notion we need to apply collaborative leadership in a post pandemic regional uh, landscape, that it's a certain approach to, and style of leadership. We need to practice much more agile decision making. There was a discussion also about reinventing the worst case. There has been a number of speakers and conversations around a fairly honest and brutal uh, conversation that some businesses are already shut and probably will not be opening. Others are finding ways how they're going to get to the end of this. And there was discussion about, you know, finding a way of what is the worst case and then maybe having to reinvent ourselves, our community, our businesses to find a way out of it. And also we've got some webinar series going around adapting Main Street and the CBD, which is that much more practical, immediate uh, impact on the heart and essence of our regional communities. But I've just added the last box there that seemed to be a common thread that everyone's sort of saying more than anything now, we need to communicate, communicate between leadership and our communities, 
amongst ourselves that people are saying we can't really be over communicating at the moment about tr helping everyone try to understand what's happening and where we're going. And again, that's the theme of these panel sessions. One subtle change I'll put on, I'll put on the diagram for those that might have seen it early on, at the bottom, over a month ago, we started with the notion of stay calm, stay safe, and don't panic. And it's been interesting the last couple of weeks through lots of conversations and networks, we're really moving, those that are looking to the future, really saying, you know, we're moving beyond that immediate shock of panic. A lot of people now saying, how are we going to use this time wisely? How are we going to be strategic? How do we prepare? How do we prepare for the relaunching, rebooting of our communities? And I think that's an interesting mood shift. And I, I see that in a lot of the conversations now. It's not so much about the shock. It's about the strategy. What can we do right now to prepare ourselves as we're coming out? So I think, again, that's uh, really helping the, uh, the conversations we're having at the moment. So I'll hand this back to you, Kate. Terrific. Thank you, uh, Robert. And uh, that uh, mud map is available. Well, it's probably a bit more sophisticated than a mud map. That diagram is available on our website as well. Um, now, I might turn to Narelle as um, our first speaker. Narelle's from uh, Central Queensland University. And thank you very much for um, coming along today. I'm wondering if you can just tell us a little bit about where the university is positioned um, and how it's uh, responded to COVID-19. Sure, thank you, Kate. So obviously across the education sector, all of the universities have been hit um, quite um, hard financially uh, with this pandemic. Um, you, we talked about originally China um, being the main uh, universities impacted, but now with all the border closures, all um, international student cohorts are impacted. Um, people might ask why that um, affects regional universities. And I think one of the things we need to think about, and, and CQU in particular, we have 27 um, sites around Australia. So we have quite a large footprint. And what we do with the, um, the regional communities is we're operating in quite thin markets. So we've got communities who need to develop skills to um, improve resilience and be able to um, fill skills shortages. Um, and so we want to offer as much as we can um, in those communities, but obviously that also comes at a cost. So the international students in effect who are mainly in our metro campuses, um, and we had quite a big growth in our international um, students, we saw that a lot of the international um, campuses were then supporting our regional campuses. And that was quite important because otherwise um, you would look at closures of um, regional campuses. And that's something we don't want to do because obviously the regions are most important for us. So COVID has had a big effect and now we're looking at things about how we can do things um, very differently. Thanks very much. And Fiona from Charles Sturt University's point of view, what's COVID doing to you? Very similar to Norell, actually being a regional university as well. Um, there's been the immediate shock, I guess, of the whole COVID event. But I think, and Norell would probably agree with this as well. I think regional universities have been really well placed to deal with it well. So for us at Charles Sturt, we've got about 45,000 students. Over half of those are already online. So like CQU, we are really well practiced in online delivery. Not to say it wasn't tricky transitioning everything across which we now have to all our students for online learning. It's a really big job, but we're really already leading in that field as regional universities. So that was sort of a positive out of a tricky situation. We've got around 2,000 staff at Charles Sturt, so we've been really making um, sure that the communication to the staff, particularly from the Vice Chancellor, is constant and really clear, and it has been. So I think the staff have been really assured of day by day by day where we we're at as a university and what and what we we're going to do. So with uh, all of our students in our accommodation have now gone home, apart from a little over 100, we've got about 100 international students who are still in accommodation and we're still looking after them and still, of course, caring, caring for them. But it's, it's a big shift and it's a big change. But one of the things I think that's really struck me is how incredibly good regional people are at adapting. And I noticed in one of your boxes, Robert, um, you had uh, drought and fire and COVID because at the moment, so many people are just looking at COVID. But for regional communities, we've had all three in a run. 
And it just really strikes me how adaptable regional people are. And I think they've, and this is probably a gross generalisation, but I think regional people have probably adapted better to having to deal with this change than a lot of city people have who are used to their lives being more orderly. We get struck with challenges all the time and have to change and pivot and be flexible. Um, so it's really hard. But I think, you know, regional Australia should give itself a pat on the back. I think we're, we're doing it really well. And I think Fiona is exactly spot on because I think, you know, being regional universities, we're forced to differentiate ourselves. So we don't follow a traditional model. We do whatever we can um, to differentiate ourselves from the other universities. And regional people are really resilient. And, you know, similar to Fiona, looking at the boxes that Robert had up, a lot of those boxes related to, to the space that we play in, not just as an educator, um, but also as our role in the community and looking post COVID, you know, we're already looking at recovery plans and, and what we need to be um, doing with our communities. It's that collaboration and communication because we need to make sure that regions, you know, still exist. We don't have the agglomeration effect that the metros have. We have bigger market vulnerability. And so we need to make sure that we will survive long term. So what sorts of things have you been doing um, to maintain your links with your com your communities on the ground? I'm happy to jump in. So we have um, um, what we call regional engagement committees across all our campuses. So um, our Associate Vice Chancellors, who are our heads of campuses, meet regularly with our regional engagement committees. The Vice Chancellor is certainly communicating with the mayors and the politicians because obviously that's really important for us as well for government to understand exactly what this impact is but you know so we're putting out the call to staff and and our communities about what are the great ideas that you can give us um, because this is a turning point for us we will have a new business model we operate under a 500 year old university model and we can't do that going forward because the world has changed Thanks for that, Narelle. And Fiona, have you got um, something similar or how do you engage with your community and how's that changed as a result of COVID-19? Yeah, like, like CQ, we are really, really engaged. We've got four directors of external engagement across our campuses. We've got six main campuses in New South Wales. And our directors are absolutely fantastic. So big shout out to Samantha, Julia and Kate and James because they have been pivotal in making sure that through all of this, they're connecting into exactly as Narelle was saying, the mayors, the businesses, industry, the politicians, the people in the community that we need to make sure know what we're doing and what's going on. And really importantly, and I, I expect from Narelle's position as well, that they understand the potential impact on regional universities of this, of this massive hit, because regional universities are so important to our local economies and the social fabric of those communities. So things that impact regional universities negatively by association impact our regional community. So we're doing very similar, that really close connectivity. And because we already have those existing relationships with our local communities, it's nothing new. We're doing this all the time. I'm looking at Narelle nodding. <laughs> They're doing it all the time as well because we're all part of the one community. And that's the great thing about, about the region. So very connected in. What sorts of wondering? I I've got a question for Fiona and Narelle. In the context of COVID, the impact is so dramatic and sudden. So I've just got a question around your views on, particularly moving forward, the potential of how universities may, may or may not be able to help with quick tactical support, um, because things are, are quite desperate for a lot of regional businesses and communities right now. They need action right now. Or is it really the strength of universities to be better placed for the policy, structural, longer term uh, support, information, skills? So, and I'm just wondering, does COVID even make you think you've got to be a bit more faster and tactical to get support out there quicker this time? What's your thoughts on that? Probably two things there. So I think, you know, one of the roles we can play is in that education piece. We've seen this whenever there has been a downturn in the economy, you know, be it SARS or recessions or whatnot, education starts to play a very big role because people want to upskill um, and they need to because suddenly when something like this happens, you realise you don't have all the answers in your business or, or, you know, even just in your life. So that will happen. But I think research will also 
play a big part in this? You know, what are the new business models? What are the regional issues that we need to be collaborating together to be able to solve? I think our difficulty, you know, in effect is our funding model because we're not funded to solve regional issues and we do it anyway. We do it for impact. But I think, you know, the government really look, needs to look at what role will the university play post recovery for COVID to support our community? Yeah, I think Nural and I are going to be completely on the same page this morning. And, and it is, it's very much, I think, um, Robert, about the, the short term, but as well as the long term. And looking at both of those things in parallel from us as regional universities and also from regional communities. So in terms of the assistance, we've got a financial assistance um, program in place for students. We've actually kicked off a program internally for research, following on Nural's comment about research, around the impact of COVID on regional communities across a whole range of areas from health and wellbeing, business performance and that sort of thing. So that will happen internally. Also too, regional universities are very good at, at micro-credentialing and short course opportunities and that will be really important for people looking to A, upskill or as you said, I think in one of your boxes, the, the opportunities, how do you use this time wisely and there'll be a, a lot of that as well. There's also the long-term um, role for regional universities in the, in the post-immediate COVID crisis for that long-term rebuild. And it'll be around, obviously, the workforce, you know, getting workforce out there and training people for the workforce. But two of the things that I think are really important and that our regional universities do as part of that social fabric is we really contribute to, to the confidence of a community and play quite often a leadership role and quite often a thought leadership role within those communities. And I think confidence and leadership are going to be two of the really key things for our regional communities to, to get through the rebuild and, and out the other side. Thanks, uh, Fiona. Can I just go back um, a little bit to um, your, community, your community engagement strategies? Are, are, um, uh, well, I'd be interested in hearing a bit more about that in terms of um, R and R and R and D and um, uh, innovation. Um, but I'm 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 also really interested in what the community is asking of the universities at the moment. So that interface with your communities um, through those sorts of engagement strategies. What what sorts of things are the communities um, asking for? Really interesting. I'll take the second bit, the second part of the question first, Kate. At the moment, it's not necessarily that they're asking for physical things. At the moment, they want knowledge. They want to know what's going on. They know what they want to know what we as a university are doing. They want to know what we're thinking about things. They want to know, you know, what's happening with our students, what's happening with the staff. So it's very much about a, a knowledge gain for them at the moment while we're in this initial first crisis part of things. Um, but it's it's not it's not rocket science. It's just a, it is, as as all well know it's just relationships with people and relationships that our people in the university have with people in our local regional communities and it's just building it's just building on that it's not rocket science at all um, in terms of research and development and, and innovation and we again I think as a regional university, you do that really flexibly. We have innovation hubs. And I noticed Narelle used the word around research before, impact. And that's what's really important for, for um, us as regional universities, doing research that has impact. So um, just as an example, Charles Sturt University did some research for Snowy Hydro on uh, one of their issues with the, the Snowy 2.0 build with a particular fish and whether or not we'd get through from, from one particular dam to another. Uh, really practical stuff that um, that regional universities do. It's interesting, and I'd be very interested in the real thoughts on this as well. That often the metropolitan universities have a very um, uh, I mean, it's nice, a kind of an insular view to research and how they do things. And I think regional universities look at research differently, which is good, which is good to, to metropolitan universities for different types of outcomes. Thank you. Um, Norelle, would you like to add to that? 
Yeah, and look, I totally agree with Fiona, surprisingly not. Um, so in terms of the community and the engagement and the request, our communities are in survival mode at the moment. So, you know, they're just looking at what they need to do, I think, to get from day to day. So I think one of the roles of the university is around opening up that conversation about what comes next. So I think we'll see a lot more of um, that from, you know, CQU and Charles Sturt um, going forward. On the R&D side, I think, Again, this is around new business models. I think the biggest struggle we have, and I totally agree with Fiona, we engage with our industry to look at what is the best research we can do that will have impact. But unfortunately, we're still measured on publications. And industry going forward are gonna need this done quicker. So there is a little bit of a disconnect until we can really move into a new metric system around research. Um, we don't have that disconnect and I don't think we can have that disconnect anymore because we have to get on top of this and we need to do it quickly in partnership with industry. Yeah. Yes, Fiona. You're on mute, Fiona. <laughs> Thank you, God. Techno is definitely not my thing. Um, but it's also from the university's perspective, we can be really flexible and really quick about things. So we've got uh, a number of our students in allied health who are supporting the local health districts. We're even down in Wagga. Um, we've now got some of our labs manufacturing um, the, the hand sanitizer thing. So really flexibly jumping around and doing, doing things quickly that we need to do in response to, as well as that knowledge in a practical way, um, when local health districts come to us and say, can we, do, can we do this for them? Well, we'll figure out a way to do it. So it's been great watching everybody just really quickly within the university, regional university you know, family, just really get on and do things as quickly as possible. Regional universities are really well placed in terms of place-based responses and you both talked about the um, coverage of your campuses, multiple campuses, um, innovation hubs, uh, regional learning hubs. Um, have, has the conversation turned to smart specialisation at all? What are your thoughts about, about that and the role of universities? You're both smiling. <laughs> uh, look, it's, it's a difficult question because there's a base set of skills that all areas, uh, all communities need. So, you know, as a minimum, we need to be providing um, that. I think it's the same um, uh, conversation that you have in regional development. We would all like smart specialisation, but it never seems to have gotten to the forefront where someone will make a decision on where that specialisation will sit. And so this is why I also think economic development strategies um, need to change as well. Because if you look at um, regional development strategies, they all look the same. Um, you know, we need to start conversations, not about what we will do, but also, and this might be a bit controversial, what government won't do. Um, because the easy option is to put everything in the metro. So, you know, at some stage you've got to limit that and you've got to commit to, you know, let's say, and, and this is a silly example, let's say Google turns up and wants to um, locate in Australia. Well, let's not put them in metros. Let's start innovation centres and knowledge centres in the region. Let's put more research into the region. That's how you'll get population um, growth. But it's not, so it's not one player. It's that triple helix. It's industry, government and universities working together and better defining our roles in regional development as well. Because I worked in regional development for eight years and it was confusing. We were tripping over each other, all trying to get a photo opportunity. Thanks, Fiona. Oh, I'm just laughing, you're right. Yeah, that could definitely was the, was the case at, at certain times, for sure. I think where, where I think there's some real opportunity out of COVID is around this decentralisation idea and the sort of things Narelle was just talking about, about not necessarily doing things in the city. It is so much, is that right? it is so much easier for governments, so I'll finger up with whatever persuasion, whatever, to, to, to put things in the cities, it's easy. It's much harder to think about regional areas and investment there because it's more complicated and it's, it's a much, it's, a, it's an area with a lot more grey. But where I think the opportunity is, all of a sudden Australian people as a result of COVID have realised they can do things differently. That 
they don't have to be all sitting in an office in Sydney to make their job work. They can work from home. They can move from somewhere else and the sky doesn't fall in and they're actually really productive and it works really, really well. So I think with the awfulness of this terrible COVID situation, it's going to come some real opportunity as well to think differently for the regions and how we operate in the regions and, and what we do. And I think universities have, uh, regional universities have a real opportunity to do even better. What we're already doing, which is responding to community need. So, excuse me, our engineering degree was set up as a complete response to local government and people in community saying, we can't get engineers. So we've done, we've done um, and very briefly, we've built a very different type of course. The students are only actually on camps for 18 months and then they're out in the field being trainee engineers as they're doing their degree. And out there in the communities, we've had people say to us, you know, our students are as good 18 months in as other students finishing a degree because it's practical and it responds really well to what the community needs. So that type of thing I think is, is going to be really important going forward. The regional universities being able to respond to what communities actually actually need and want, doing it with them, not to them. I know a little bit about the uh, work Charles Sturt, not Charles Sturt, Central Queensland Uni does um, in uh, leveraging um, it with TAFE um, for services. Is that something similar? Do you have something similar in CSU? We do. In our, we've got a, a campus down at Wangaratta, which is actually a dual purpose built um, when it was done initially between us and uh, Goulburn's Oven and TAFE down there. We've also got MOUs with, uh, with Wagga and Albury, with the council, the TAFE, and with us as well around you know, operating, operating together in those regions, which is really good. And we've got a lot of partnerships with TAFE that uh, are pathways for students to come through from TAFE through to university and um, you know I don't know all I know this story better than anyone but you get a lot of students particularly when they're young who aren't confident enough to go away or who may not have got the the marks necessarily to go to university and TAFE is that brilliant stepping stone so they can pathway through they can potentially do their first year at home in their own community before they think about going away to uni and that partnership arrangement and approach I think we can do even better and is really a really important outcome for regional people who want to study. Thank you. Um, I, there's a couple of questions um, here. One from Lynn um, saying, uh, given online learning's provided the solution in this crisis, is there a threat going forward to the survival of regional universities? So if you can go online to UQ, um, would you do that rather than go to a regional university? How are the universities responding to that? Do they see that as a threat? Or, or not, and the, and the second question from Anthony um, is very much uh, looking forward, uh, uh, for, forward thinking um, about post-COVID, saying in a post-globalist economic scenario, won't new local industries be needed and won't they have to be regional given land use issues? So two questions there, um, but about the future of universities. I might, can I start with the first one? Yes. Yeah. So look, obviously it's a threat because you'll also see that Harvard has come online as well. So um, there is going to be more people playing in that online space. But, you know, the thing we did a few years ago in recognition of this threat um, before COVID was, and you'll see this from our campus expansion to 27 sites, and particularly the, um, the regional university centres as well, is that online isn't great for everybody and particularly first year school leavers, you do need um, some sort of a presence and some sort of support in local communities to help people with their university journey. So I think study centres are going to become more important going forward um, because otherwise you're just sitting in this whole um, you know, abyss of, of online. It does give people flexibility. One of the things we see is that students tend to not go to face-to-face -face lectures because they're working and the online um, lectures give them the ability to fit everything in. So it's going to be interesting and going online isn't easy. You know, we've been in it probably 20 years. Um, Charles Sturt's probably been in it around the same time. So it does take a very long time to get to a position where you do it well. Um, it's not an overnight thing of let's just transition courses um, because students will struggle and then we'll see increased attrition. 
Fiona? That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Look, and, and it is a threat, but the world is changing and how people choose to study is changing. So I think the, the easiest way to, to put it, it's not a one size fits all. What fits one student isn't going to fit another student. What suits somebody in Sydney isn't going to suit something in region, isn't going to suit somebody somewhere else in the regional community. So to be able to offer all sorts of opportunities to access tertiary education, I think is the important thing. So whether somebody wants to do full online, whether somebody wants to be on campus or a blend, that's gonna be the key, making sure that people have the opportunity to do it the way they'd like to do it. So um, we're a bit, we're like the role, you know, we've been doing this for a long time, um, but it's, it's a thing, being able to be flexible and change. And Monica Davis, I think is on the, um, on the webinar from Country University Centre, and they have done a brilliant job, an absolutely brilliant job with the, the university centres, which again adds another option for students who want a more supported type of online learning, which has just been great. And I know CQU has done a great job at this. We've been working with CUC as well. And it's, I think it's the ability for regional universities to think outside the square and not recognise that things are just black and white and that regional learning is great. But for regional communities and, and the regions to be as strong as they can be, we need to make sure that Everybody in the region who wants an opportunity to access tertiary education can have it through some way, shape or form, and that will contribute to, to growing stronger regions. Yeah, totally agree, Fiona. And I think the university centres is a great example because it's a partnership with the local community. And that is what I think is the strength of these sort of organisations because we can't just parachute in and say, hey, we've got all the answers for your community. It's got to be a bottom up um, type of development around tertiary education. So um, big thumbs up to university centres. Yeah. And Kate, the, the second part to the question around the, the forward thinking and, and how the thinking is going to change. I think it really will. We've, we've been clearly on a path for some time where as a country, you know, we've gotten used to in some degrees just the reliance on, on overseas provision of things. I think we're going to have a real choker chain pull of how we look to the future and the future thinking of this nation and how reliant we do want to remain on overseas provision and how much more we want to take responsibility for our own production. I expect there's about to be, once we get through the crisis and we start the, the looking at the rebuild, I think there's going to be a really big national conversation around domestic manufacturing, around what we want to do here, around what the opportunities are. The world has changed so much since what I would call the beginning of the decline of manufacturing. Can we do it better? Is the technology there and the robotics and things like that going to make it more accessible? But coming back to the key thing, we have to have a discussion around why manufacturing declined in the first place. So we understand the reasons why and don't just go down a road of, yes, let's go back to manufacturing because we have to deal with the, the challenges of manufacturing before we even look at setting up a new world environment of manufacturing. But I think it's something that, that's really quite exciting. Thank, thank you. Um, we've got a, a, just a comment here, um, but it's, it's encrypted. So I'll have to ask um, Narelle to, to explain it to us. Um, someone saying that G GUC led the way on mixed mode community owned regional university centres. I don't know what GUC is and I'd like to. Oh, <laughs> Geraldton. Geraldton. Oh, right. <laughs> I could have guessed actually in retrospect that it was Geraldton. Yes, it certainly has been a pioneer in this, in this space. Um, just to go to this post globalization. Just before, just, oh, sorry, Kate. Just before we, just before we move on, can I just give Geraldton a really big shout out? I was over there many, many, many years ago when they were, you know, not not long kicked off, and they really pioneered how to do this, and they did it really, really well. And you see them now all over the country. So, you know, big shout out, big shout out to them. And CQU is still very involved. I think you're with Geraldton. Yeah, it, really good job. Mm. Oh, that's terrific. Um, okay, then. Uh, thank you to Geraldton. Uh, if I could now just look for a, a, a bit further at the engineering idea that you had, um, are there other uh, industries that you see the university articulating with? And I'll give you an example of this, um, was that when we were at Segra down at Port Augusta, we had a researcher's day. And in that researcher's day, um, 
by happenstance, someone from biosecurity was one of the speakers and he was from Adelaide saying that he has terrible trouble recruiting biosecurity staff to work at Port Augusta. And uh, he was saying the skill set that they needed was to be able to work in sterile environments. And the university said, hey, well, we train nurses, so we ought to be on top of how to work in sterile environments. We could run a course um, that recruited people from the local region. So you weren't trying to persuade people to move to Port Augusta, but to find people in Port Augusta um, who could do uh, who could do a short course of some kind. Uh, and then um, the tomato, Sundrop Tomato Factory, which is there as well, the hydroponics said, well, we actually need people who can work in sterile environments at the moment as well. So there was um, two unmet needs that the university um, could, could offer um, programs. How does that fit for universities, um, that sort of uh, design a course, I suppose? I love it. I think that's a really good example of industry and universities, you know, coming together to to meet those unmet needs. I haven't seen anything like it um, at the moment, but I think this is where we'll start to think outside the square because, you know, health in particular, and then those offshoots that you spoke about, is going to be one of the biggest growth. Well, we all know this is going to be the biggest growth industry that um, we'll see going into the future. So um, I'd like to explore it more. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I think one of the things that we know about regional universities, if you train a student in the regions, they're far more likely to go and practice their profession in the region. And if you couple that with rural origin, if they actually come from a rural area to start with, they're even more likely. So we've got a chance to, we've got around 80% of our students who graduate go on to practice their profession in a regional area. So around building workforce capacity in the regions. Regional universities are really important because they're actually training the students to go and to graduate to go and practice their profession in the region. And I think there's a lot more we can do around that. So the big picture around that, so even things like our, our medical school at Charles Sturt, which will come online next year, same principle. That has all been set up with precisely this view that we're going to grow doctors for the bush. You know, train in the regions, we know they're going to be far more likely to go back to the regions. And so that really does respond to that community need. And at Charleston, even down to things like, we've just started this year a graduate certificate in community leadership and resilience. And that came about purely from working with local communities, consultation for what they saw they needed. And it's a grad cert that can be just done, you know, people can just pick up a particular module that they like and do it, or they can do the, the, um, the combination of the modules and end up with the, the graduate certificate. So it's that sort of stuff responding to community that that's really, that regional unis do really well. I think the other thing, um, sorry, Kate, um, the other thing post COVID that's gonna make regions and, you know, in effect, um, regional universities really important is, at the moment, 60% of exports comes from the regions, not, not the metros, and we've got 40% of the population. For the, for the Australian economy to recover post-COVID and pay back the debts that you know, we're starting to accumulate, export is gonna become more and more important. So having the skilled workers to be able to work in those industries and the productivity in those industries is gonna be really important as well. I guess- Yes, Robert. Oh, I was just wondering to follow on from a few points there about um, the structural impact of COVID on learning. Um, and I'm just wondering how you might think it might challenge your institutions that going online is sort of proving that, you know, you, you don't need to have a four year degree. You can learn the fundamentals in way less. And that's, that's a challenge that I think the online study will do about challenging some of the perceptions of duration of study. But I think that's also tied with the points both of you raised earlier, which I thought are quite profound on a future about the social dimensions. And I wonder if it's actually shifting in a way that um, the technology of learning is commoditized, it can be pre it needs to be more efficient and faster. And but the role of universities might be more the soft uh, infrastructure, that sort of nurturing and transition, and less reliant on saying you've got to sit there for five years to learn this. Mm. What, what are your thoughts on, on that? and its evolution? Uh, 
It's, an, it's a really interesting question. I think it's something we need to think about because, you know, micro-credentialing, short courses and all of that sort of thing, MOOCs, we've, we've sort of um, had to deal with this sort of stuff for a while now. And I think the biggest impediment was how do employers know that you've gained that qualification and, and you know, in, in some of these areas. So, but technology will deal with that. And so that won't be an inhibitor. And you're right, it's, it is um, becoming more commoditised um, as well. So I think that's where we start, have to start thinking a little bit differently. I actually think people will look at not just undergrad degrees, they'll be looking at vertical degrees that takes them into masters and whatnot going forward because they need to differentiate themselves. You know, when I came out of university, if you then had a masters, it was amazing. Now most people have two or three masters and a PhD. So, you know, again, what are those qualifications going to look like? What are employers going to look like? You know, we saw accounting firms a little while ago say, oh, we're not even going to bother with, with graduates. And I'm an accountant by trade. And, and seriously, with the postgrad stuff I've done, that was much um, better for me because you could apply it to the job um, as well. So, you know, maybe the vet model of apprenticeship type style learning for education will also be considered as well. It is a really good question, Robert. And I think, again, I just come back to my point about, you know, it's not a one size fits all. Different people will want different things. So some people will want to do it quickly. Really good point from Narell about the, the, the acceptance of qualifications from employers and those sorts of things. But also you've got people who are working at the same time. They don't want to do it quickly. They want to blend it in with their job and they're happy to take five years to do it. So I think you just need to, to have that flexibility. Um, Kate, if we can, there's a question, I think, from Anthony Hogan around manufacturing going yes. offshore. Really interesting. Can we just have a chat about that? Yes. Sure, go for it. Um, I suppose everyone can see the question on their on their oh, screen. No. So, yeah, yeah. So around manufact didn't manufacturing go offshore in pursuit of lower labour costs? Um, yeah, absolutely. And this is why I think Anthony, if we're going to go down this road of considering how manufacturing might look if we want to change our current thinking as a nation, then we have to understand why what happened. We have to understand what happened before and why it stopped. And you're right. But interestingly, there's some discussion already starting through, you know, corporate and business about the notion of potentially paying more to have the surety of locally produced manufacturing, which I think is going to be really interesting. So the whole dynamic might change. So what was important before around manufacturing people, you know, getting things cheaply, um, COVID, post-COVID, that mindset might, might well change. And that's why I think, this is gonna be one of the key, really interesting national discussions we're gonna have going forward, but really good, really good questions, Anthony. Yeah, I agree because, you know, a lot of people are talking um, about this and, you know, it's the basis of comparative advantage where you can produce it cheapest, that's where it should be um, made. But, you know, are people going to value that um, at the end of the day? Because manufacturing was all about, okay, could we then value add because we're not the cheapest and therefore it was, it was all sort of going offshore. So I think, you know, even debates around tariffs and the protection at the border is also going to come back into it as well, particularly when you see luxury goods cheaper than essential things like food, um, electricity and services. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think that the discussion around value adding in agriculture is really going to be one of the other key ones of what we can do and what we've been potentially missing out on. Not value adding, shipping our bulk commodities offshore and having the value adding done um, internationally. Do we want to look at how we could better do that now and have times changed enough that we could do that? So it's, it's an awful, awful period of COVID, but I think there's massive opportunities for this nation going forward, particularly in regional Australia. It, it's, it's really, it's potentially a very exciting time. I know it sounds crazy saying that in, uh, in, in the middle of a COVID crisis, but I think with any negatives, you've got to look at a positive and are there positives to come out? In your box earlier, Robert, as you were saying, you know, what can we think about now to position ourselves for what's going to come with the rebuild and all of those sorts of things? And the more thinking we do now about how regional Australia is going to look down the track, the better off we'll be as we go through the rebuild and we'll make hopefully the right decisions about how we want to look into the future. Yeah, so and like that's exactly right. Topic. It could be a good research topic. And the other thing that Anthony asked was about, I said about Economics 101 um, with the people follow jobs. That's a really interesting one because we certainly didn't see that in the mining sector where there were very highly paid jobs in regions and we still had to FIFO people in 
um, to the mining region. So, you know, there is so many confounding variables uh, around mobility. You know, what else the regions need to do to make themselves more attractive? That uh, um, picks up on an interesting comment that's come through in the question and answer box but from Angelo saying, is creating a degree in engineering enough to attract domestic students to study engineering um, in place? Um, and pointing out that there needs to be some kind of awareness programs that need to be developed for high school students to create awareness. I know this came up in the national strategy um, that the importance of people knowing what in, in remote and regional areas, knowing what universities have to offer, regional universities have to offer, and also to see it as a fit for themselves. It's, it's a very good point. And, and we, you know, try, and I know CQ, you would as well, try really hard to make sure you get that information to um, school students about their options and choices for when they finish school. And it's really early. People start thinking really, really early in their, in their life journey about what they may or may not want to do or want to be. So we've got to make sure we're doing as much as we can so people are aware of those opportunities. But particularly in regional areas, we've got a lot of challenges around lower socioeconomic and around Indigenous participation and how we address that and do that better. I'm, I'm really proud at Charles Sturt. We graduate the highest number of Indigenous students. And that ability to provide opportunity for people who quite often in lower socioeconomic areas are first in their family to go to university is really important. So that aspiration, and again, coming back to the confidence that people have confidence to think, yes, I can do that. I can go into tertiary study and do it. It's much harder for people who haven't had someone in their family do it before them. A lovely story at the university, I was talking to a woman a while ago and she um, she was, oh, she might have been in her late 40s, early 50s, and she had gone through and done a degree to show her daughter, who at the time she was started was, was an early teenager, that it was possible to do it. And her daughter then went on and, and enrolled in doing, doing a degree. And I just thought that was such a wonderful story that, you know, there's a mother who's gone, the best thing I can do for my child is show them that it can be done. And that sort of stuff, we've really got to focus on making sure people realise that they can do it and there will be support for them while they're doing it. And I think that's the value of universities because, you know, historically we've seen generation follow generation. You know, if you're a farmer, you, your sons became farmers, 